In many countries, flying at night requires either an instrument rating or a special night rating. But in the U.S., your basic private pilot ticket gives you all manner of night privileges. Flying in clouds in IMC or flying at night without ground references, like we see here taking off out of Lake Tahoe, both require us to navigate by instruments. But only the first situation requires the instrument rating. How do you know when departing from an airport at night like this one in the mountains that you won't smack into anything? Instrument pilots know about ODPs, obstacle departure procedures, but I'm of the opinion that VFR-only pilots should be aware of them too. They're designed to keep you from hitting terrain on departure, so if you're flying at night and can't see the big mountains we're directly flying into here, why wouldn't you use the instrument departure too? Bear in mind that as VFR pilots, we don't have any requirement to follow instrument procedures, and even on an IFR flight, Part 91 doesn't always require that the ODP be flown. But again, what keeps you legal doesn't necessarily keep you safe. So whether you're a VFR or IFR pilot, I'm going to introduce you to ODPs to keep you clear of the ground. We're going to look at the Terminal Procedures publication, which has charted and text-based instrument procedures. We're going to turn to the Takeoff Minimum section, to the page for this airport, South Lake Tahoe, California. You can access this on ForeFlight easily by pulling up the airport page, tapping Procedures, and then Departures. When you tap takeoff minimums, we're taken to that same page for this airport. The first thing we're going to look at is the takeoff minimums. We're using runway 18, which faces into the high mountains south of the field. Keep in mind that these minimums are not required for Part 91, IFR, or VFR flights. But why would you not have a glance at the minimums since they're designed to protect aircraft from flight into terrain? The minimums for runway 18 are standard, meaning for an aircraft with one or two engines, one statute mile and require a minimum climb gradient of 810 feet per nautical mile, up to 10,800 feet. This is a very steep climb. The standard climb gradient for IFR departures is 200 feet per mile, so this is more than four times that. If we look at the POH for the Cirrus SR-22 we'll be flying, we see that at the altitude we'll be climbing out of, at standard temperatures with a slightly lighter aircraft, we're going to have difficulty making that gradient. We may want to look at using the opposite runway, or, as an alternative in the takeoff minimums, if the ceilings are at least 1,600 feet in visibility at least 3 miles, we could do a gradient of 765 feet per mile, a little shallower. Our scenario has us going VFR, so this should work, and our performance tables allow for it, assuming we're at that lighter weight and lower temperatures. If we had trouble, we could look at the minimums for runway 36. It says the minimums are 300 foot ceilings with a mile and 3 eighths visibility. Again, we're VFR, so we have well over this. It doesn't mention climb gradient, which means standard applies for us, 200 feet per nautical mile. No problem in our Cirrus, so runway 36, which takes us out over the lake, is an option. But let's say the winds really don't favor it. Next, we want to look at the departure procedure for runway 18. It has us climbing on heading 177, which is runway heading, up through 7,900 feet MSL, and then continuing the climb in a right turn to intercept the 133 radial from Squaw Valley flying inbound to the station. What this is doing is keeping us on runway heading until we're high enough to make a right turn and clear the mountains west of the field as we proceed to the VOR to the northwest. We could continue VFR from there at a safe altitude we planned. In the opening scenario, we just took off straight out and kept climbing, ignorant of the right turn in the ODP, which is why we had some trouble there with the terrain. This procedure requires us to be adept at tracking and intercepting radials, which is something we work on in IFR training but might not be reasonable to expect VFR-only pilots to be comfortable with. If you're IFR proficient and are doing a night VFR flight like this, the ODP may work well for you. But if you're not as comfortable, let's look at another option. Down below on the takeoff minimums page is something called VCOA, Visual Climb Over Airport. Climb in visual conditions to cross the airport at or above 11,200 feet, and then proceed along the radial to the VOR. Unlike before, this won't be a difficult radial to follow. The 127 radial passes right through the field, so this is essentially a direct route to the station. You can go direct to Squaw Valley on your GPS if VOR navigation isn't your thing. Just make sure you're starting the route from roughly over the airport. IFR pilots need ATC approval for this, but VFR, it's just what the name implies, a visual climb as we circle the airport. We'll make left traffic and keep the airport in sight off to our left. Once we're above 11,200, we can head straight for the VOR we have plugged in. Now, this airport at Lake Tahoe is an extreme example. You won't often need to do a very involved departure procedure with VOR radials and the like. This is Front Royal in Virginia at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. The takeoff minimums for runway 10 allow us for a climb in VFR with a standard 200 foot per mile angle, 
but notice that for 2.8, the instrument departure is NA, not allowed due to obstacles. We should take note of this as VFR pilots at night. Sometimes airports won't have any departure procedures. This is Leia County Regional in New Mexico. It's pretty flat around here, but at night we aren't sure about any towers or other obstructions, so we take a look at the takeoff minimums. There are no minimums and no departure procedures listed, other than for runway 3. The FAA has done what's called a diverse departure assessment, looking at any and all terrain and obstructions around the airport, many of which are listed here, and determined that a safe departure can be made with an acceptable clearance above them in any direction. For IFR pilots, this means they'll be expected to maintain runway centerline on departure, crossing the departure end at least 35 feet above the ground, and make a first turn 400 feet above the departure end elevation. Yeah, as VFR pilots, we don't need to remember all that, just that in an airport like this one, we're okay to stay on runway heading to an altitude where we would normally feel comfortable making a turnout. Now, it's not feasible for the FAA to make a departure assessment on every airport in the country. In fact, if the airport doesn't have an instrument approach procedure, it won't have a departure assessment done either. This is Mineral County Airport in Colorado, Charlie 24. It's a public use airport, but it doesn't have any procedure associated with it. It's nestled in a deep valley in the Rockies, so it would certainly fail any diverse departure assessment by the FAA and have an ODP assigned to it. But without one, extreme care should be exercised operating out of here at night with no reference to the ground. I realize that these recommendations go beyond what's written in the regulations and that VFR-only pilots can, by all rights, ignore instrument procedures like ODPs. But I think that given the difficulty seeing terrain at night, being familiar with the same procedures designed to keep instrument flights out of trouble is a great way to add a degree of safety for your flights. Consider referencing obstacle departure procedures on your VFR night flights going forward, especially in areas you're not as familiar with. And if you haven't already, get yourself an IFR rating. We can help at Flight Insight with Instrument Online Ground School. Check it out at the link here and in the description.